Welcome to Hill Country Chapter of the National Weather Association in partnership with Shriner University welcomes Troy Kimmel, Senior Lecturer in Studies in Weather and Climate in the Department of Geography and the Environment at the University of Texas at Austin. One of Austin's best known broadcast meteorologists, he holds full membership and has earned certifications through the American Meteoro Meteorological Society the National Weather Association and the International Association of Broadcast Meteorologists. He's a member of the Campus Safety Committee and the Meteorologists supporting all athletic programs at the University of Texas. His presentation tonight will focus on weather safety at mass gatherings and outdoor events, and we will follow the presentation with a question and answer period. So if you would, please present your uh, questions in the chat box, the question and answer session, and also please let us know who you are and where you're from if you would uh, reply to the chat line as well. Troy, we welcome you and we look forward to hearing what you have to present for us this evening. Matt, uh, what an introduction, man. Where do I send the check? You know, um, <laughs> quite, quite an introduction and I appreciate that. Not sure that I'm necessarily worthy of that, but um, it's a it's a pleasure to um, to join our Hill Country chapter and uh, Shriner U University as well. And and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to uh, be here with you tonight. Um, so our topic tonight is really about weather safety. And there are about 27 different ways we can really go with this. Um, but I wanna, as we, as particularly as we wrap up, to really get some views from the folks out there that are watching us tonight uh, about your thoughts about some things. Um, as Matt told you, um, I have been uh, involved at the University of Texas on faculty since the fall of 1988. This is my 31st year at UT, uh, serving on campus safety and security there and, and the university meteorologist, but I also have a history in broadcast as well. I uh, started out in TV and radio broadcast back in, uh, I don't really want to say, but it was a while back, uh, late 70s, um, and have seen that side of the business as well. I discontinued that um, in about 2012. I was at, uh, I have been at in the past uh, three of the five TV stations here in Austin. So I've kind of worked my way around town. Uh, I think in some ways it gives me kind of a unique view on things and particularly how um, that uh, things kind of change in your career. I the, I know I have a lot of students that perhaps are watching tonight and things like that. And the one thing that I would say uh, is that um, just never say never. Uh, whatever you do in your academic life, the one thing that I encourage people to do is never say never. And don't, when you say never sometimes, I always tell my students, you will see because life has a way, interesting way of uh, turning things around. I, I think when I started out in television, uh, back in the late 1970s. Uh, I saw myself being in that for my entire career. When uh, the University of Texas came a visiting back in the uh, late 1980s, I would never have envisioned that. And then I would never envision the fact that I would leave TV like I did back in 2012 and, and be at the University of Texas. It's, uh, I, have, I have a lot of fun at the university uh, in addition to teaching, uh, being the university meteorologist. Um, so how does this all tie to weather safety? And, and especially in, in, in 2020, I, I know I'm speaking tonight somewhat to a captive crowd. All of us are sort of a captive crowd tonight because of what's going on in the world around us. And I think that uh, it's worth saying that I think weather safety and how we look at it nowadays, not only in academia, because Frankly, I'm going to, as people know that know me, I sometimes am not necessarily politically correct. And I'm, I'm going to say this to some degree, and I think Shriner is probably more the exception to this, but sometimes universities are not the real world. They're not the real world beyond the campus. And I say that about UT even, that you've got to get beyond the campus a little bit. But I think weather safety and how we look at it in 2020 is somewhat different from maybe weather safety and how we looked at it in 2000 and weather safety and how we looked at it back when I first started my career back in, in 1980. And I think it's interesting where we are tonight in the middle of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic worldwide that I, 
we've got to be more attentive to these sort of things because as Dr. Kevin Clazel likes to say, Kevin is a close friend. He's a university meteorologist up at OU, and he is uh, also the executive director, basically, of the Oklahoma Climate Survey, and he does a lot of outreach. And one thing that he says that I really would ask that you take with you tonight is that hope, that's H-O-P-E, hope is not a plan. When we talk about weather safety, you cannot just sit there and hope. And everyone that's watching us here tonight, if you don't believe me, um, in this building that I'm in or in a building that you're in, if you have a fire in the middle of the night at 2 a.m., you don't need to start discussing fire safety at that point. You need to start having that discussion ahead of time. You need to have a plan. Hope is not a plan. And that's one thing in emergency management we look at nowadays. And frankly, uh, I will tell you now, uh, our country was not prepared for COVID-19. We weren't. Um, in fact, some of the people that were maybe best prepared in this country were more of the private sector companies. Uh, at UT, we've had a pandemic disease plan for years, and I'm sure the university does as well, uh, but I don't think we really understood it until this thing got down on top of us. We're not really that well prepared. As I begin my talk tonight about weather safety, I'm asking you to be prepared, have that talk. And it's not easy sometimes about having that talk because you know what we do and these things that are in the top of our head, our brains do, they'll try to talk you out of having a plan. Their your brain will sit there and go, well, I've never been through that before and I'll never go through that. By the way, remember what I just said a couple of minutes ago, just say never and you'll see. We've got to have that plan and we've got to have it thought through. I'll guarantee you over the next couple of years, we're going to have a lot better plan in this country for, uh, for uh, pandemic diseases. We're going to sit there and rehash this and go back through the plans we had and redo them. And I think we, uh, I hope that we learn a little bit as a result of that. So we've got the, the Hill Country uh, NWA chapter. We've got other folks that are here to, to talk about weather safety. Um, I want to step back, and, and by the way, this all this does is tell you how old I am, so uh, we'll let it go with that, but you look back at weather safety and, and back in the years, and uh, last night I did a, a podcast with my friend James Spann, uh, Weather Brains, which we do on Monday night, and someone brought up the fact, you know, with all these tornadoes in the south lately, uh, don't you just open your window and equalize the pressure for the tornadoes? Isn't that supposed to save you? And for you folks, especially you younger folks out there, you may not have ever heard that, but that was a safety rule in the United States in the late 60s and 70s. As the tornado approached, you were supposed to go in open windows in your house to equalize the pressure. That was the quickest way to get yourself killed. And it didn't take us long to realize that. So as we look at these things and, and, and we look at weather safety, we realize that some of these things may change with time. Um, as we've come along, um, I think we've made some pretty good decisions. I think at some point the government guidelines for severe weather, tornadoes and flash floods got too confusing. I think we have to keep those rules uh, pretty simple uh, and to the point. Uh, I like the one nowadays for tornadoes. It's, and by the way, in Kerrville, in this area of the Hill Country, two weeks ago, we had a couple of EF1 tornadoes up the road in Gillespie County. And we had one uh, over around Round Mountain in northern Blanco County as well. So I don't want to hear, the, the worst thing that meteorologists want to hear is it'll never happen to me. You want to bet. You want to bet your life that it'll never happen to me. And so we've got we've to realize it can and we plan ahead and, and we kind of go um, from there. Um, a couple of things about meteorology and then I'm going to talk about some of the safety rules and and, and things that, uh, how they've kind of changed through the years. And again, I think as far as we're concerned and the general public and, and communicating with the general public with safety rules, I think we have to keep it very simple. Simple to the point, help them be able to make intelligent uh, decisions. And we have to be good critical thinkers. Now, there are more than a few of you just now that I think probably chuckled when I said that, we're not very good at critical thinking in this country right now. We're not. This country is not good at critical thinking. Things have kind of gone 
uh, uh, caddy whompers on us in the last uh, month and a half, and it's gotten us where I'm afraid that a lot of us are emotionally thinking rather than critically thinking. We really must sit there and think through these plans and think through the things that we want to do, and we we kind of go from there. That's what uh, got us beyond the opening the windows and tornado bit. You know what the rule is for tornado safety? I don't care if you're in Memor Royal Memorial Stadium here at the University of Texas, whether we're in our facilities on campus at Triner at the university or where we are, whether you're, no matter where you are, whether you're in your home, the rule is very simple. Put as many walls between you and the tornado as you can on the lowest floor that you can. That's it. Tornado safety rules, that's it. If you can get below the ground um, in an uh, underground shelter, that's the best. Uh, people in the Hill Country laugh at me when I bring that up because there are not many places underground you can go, except the only thing underground in the Texas Hill Country is a bunch of limestone rock. Um, so it, we don't have many underground or basements to go to. But the rule is pretty simple. Put as many walls between you and the outside as you can and do it on the lowest floor that you can. And as you start to add up those walls and get away from windows and tornadoes become largely survivable. Now, you, you get into EF4, EF5 type of damage. It is harder to survive it no matter where you are unless you're below ground. But at the same time, you know how many EF4 and 5s there are? In a lot of cases, EF4s and 5s in this country can be counted on your two hands uh, as they occur every year. So you want to increase the, the likelihood you're going to be able to survive. We need to be able to critically think uh, through a lot of these sort of things. We also must sort of get our brain out of the way. Our brain is good at dismissing threats sometimes. This, as I pointed out, this will never uh, happen to me. That's one of the things that I always hear the biggest. I, I never believe that this will happen to me. Now, by the way, they'll say that, people will say that until the day the tornado hits, and then it's pretty amazing. Um, every one of us on this uh, webinar tonight, we all make decisions particularly as it involves threats based on our past experiences. I don't, I'm not going to take a hand count or anything, but I'd be willing to say most of us probably have not been a, through a tornado in our house. And so our brain up here is most likely to say, I've never been through a tornado in my house. Therefore, I probably won't need to worry about this and I move on. And that's not the way you do it. You're going to plan, you plan ahead, you have your actions planned ahead, and, and you go from there. Um, it's interesting uh, where we are with, as Matt was talking about, with large venue settings, football games, baseball games, outside concerts. Um, folks, let me tell you something. Uh, being involved in this, five or 10 years ago, um, when I went to Texas A&M University back in the 70s and 80s, if there was a thunderstorm that came up during a football game, you played even harder. Uh, you never stopped playing that football game. I, I was at football games where the lightning was flashing all over the place. We didn't think about it. And we were very fortunate that we lived through the experience. But what we're finding now increasingly since the 2000s and really post 9-11 is that we have to have a plan. Emergency management is important, uh, whether it's the federal, the state, the city, the university level. Um, folks, this is, it's all there to help us to be able to live on to another day. And this has really changed a whole lot. Whereas I, I know it's frustrating for a lot of people if you turn on a, 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 pro, a professional football game on Sunday afternoon to watch your favorite football team and all of a sudden there's a thunderstorm and you go into a thunderstorm delay. Trust me, I worked in television for a while. I've interrupted more than a few football games with severe thunderstorm, flash flood and tornado warnings. People coming over to burn your house down. They're upset that you've interrupted the football game. And if a thunderstorm interrupts the football game, they hate it even worse. And our whole thing is really, again, post 9-11, um, is that we are now realizing we have to make sometimes unpopular decisions about these events. Um, we have been fortunate since I've been at the University of Texas with the Longhorns here during football games. Let me also tell you, that the University of Texas has one of the best athletic staffs. Uh, David Allison uh, is in charge of uh, athletic safety. This man is uh, comes out of Washington background in security in Washington, D.C. 
and he runs a, a safety program uh, for athletics. And he is one of the people I work with. And, and I've got to tell you, my advice to the university, I always tell them a lot of times as a meteorologist, my advice is sort of advisory. Uh, because guess what? Y'all get paid the big money. You get to make the big decisions. But I'll tell you, any time that I've asked David or Jimmy Johnson, who is assistant vice president for safety at UT, or Chief David Carter, who's our police chief and, and, and assistant vice president for security at UT, any time I've ever asked for anything, there's never been any hesitation. They've always been willing to listen to me. And we're just finding out that so how important this is. And by the way, any students out there watching, I, I would encourage you, if you have any interest in this, go spend some time and, and look at events that we've seen that have resulted in people's deaths. Uh, Indianapolis a couple of years ago, a concert where this severe thunderstorm, there were some people that said this came without warning. Well, I'm going to hold my language here, but I called you know what on that. There was plenty of warning on that storm. It was bad decisions made at the level of the concert. They should have made decisions. And that stage came down. We killed people that evening at that concert. There was a severe thunderstorm warning. The National Weather Service office in Indianapolis had issued one, and it was in effect. It was just never taken by these people. And, I, and by the way, there are still lots of lawsuits going on regarding that. Um, within the last year, we had a uh, severe thunderstorm event at uh, some of the casinos just north of the Red River into Oklahoma there along I-35 during a concert there. We had people injured. Fortunately, I don't think any people were killed. Um, football, university level games really have, uh, and, and largely you've got to give credit to the NCAA, um, to uh, the larger groups, because they've really stepped in and, and they've required a lot of attention to weather safety at university levels. But we still have some work to go. I'll tell you that professional baseball has been one of the slower ones to kind of climb on board with all this. So large weather venue, uh, large venue weather safety is something near and dear to my heart uh, when it comes down to it. And by the way, we're not just talking about um, tornadoes, severe thunderstorm winds and things like this. We're talking about something that doesn't make the thunderstorm severe, that term. It's slight. Uh, lightning is not a criteria for severe weather in the United States. Lightning accompanies every thunderstorm. And I think that, uh, again, I would ask you, um, you folks that are joining us out there tonight, how many people have been struck by lightning? I don't think many people have, but I will tell you the people that have been struck by lightning and have lived through it, uh, they don't sit out the lightning anymore. Their brain, brain's pretty funny about that. Uh, once you get struck by lightning, what? Your brain says, you know what? Been there, done that. I think I'll go inside. And, you know, this is something that we've got to think about for even these things that, that some people may think are just sort of silly. Uh, these are things that I think we have to, to, to really look at. Um, one of the big things that has, has really been a huge issue in the last, I want to say in the last 10 years, and this is another huge area for students if they're interested. You don't have to be a meteorologist necessarily to get into this. And that is the work of the social scientists looking at how well meteorologists do their job. Listen to me carefully again. This is social scientists that are looking and looking at how we communicate warning messages because what? How well we communicate that warning message and how it comes into the non-meteorologist's mind will determine whether or not they'll make intelligent decisions. And, and social scientists, uh, uh, Kim up at OU is one of my good friends up at OU. She's involved. She talks to people. She goes in after storms and visits and does research and looks and sees how they reacted to storms. And other folks up there, these are not meteorologists. Kim's not a meteorologist. Um, these are social scientists that are looking at how well we are able to communicate our message because the meteorology can be perfect. And by the way, not a secret here for you, not ever going to be perfect. But it could be perfect, and we're still going to have people die. And that's what I think in 2020 we've got to look at. We've got to look how well our warning message is going out, and more importantly, what people are perceiving when they get those types of, of warning messages. Um, 
By the way, anyone know what the number one weather killer is around the world on an average annual basis? Uh, by the way, if you're going for the sexy stuff and you think it's tornadoes or hurricanes or, or lightning or anything else, you're wrong. Number, number one killer around the globe on an average annual basis is heat. How sexy is heat? I can show you a flash flood on video. I can show you a tornado on video. I can show you a lightning on video. It's hard for me to show you heat on video, but it's the number one killer. And we've got to begin to look at those things that are not, I mean, they're, it's killing the most people on a global scale. We've got to get better in getting those messages out about those things that are not. Uh, so dynamic. One thing that uh, it doesn't have that much to do with large weather safe venue safety, but I talked to the Hill Country. This is one thing, and I, and I know that our Hill Country chapter, probably you've had presentations on this. We live in Flash Flood Alley. We have more people in the Hill Country, the Austin, San Antonio area, on average, on an average annual basis, that are killed by flash floods than than other weather types around here. We've got to get better at that. And believe me, when um, hopefully, I uh, don't want to get into your business, but hopefully, you know, bathe in water, we swim in water, we do all this. I think in a way we sort of consider water to be our friend. I got news for you. Water's not your friend in a flash flood. It'll take you out like that. And we have got to get better in how we communicate those messages. Um, and I will tell you, it gets me uh, uh, kind of uh, exaggerated, a little excited, a little mad, honestly, when we have to go out and send our first responders, our law enforcement, our EMS, our fire department people out to rescue people who have made a bad decision in a low water crossing. Because we're now putting our first responders at risk when we should be able to communicate this message more keep people out of those low water crossings. And that's why, by the way, just to let you know why really the city of San Antonio was led the way many years ago. And I don't know that I like this. I really don't want the government in my business. I really don't because I think they do a lot of things, some things they don't do very well. Um, I don't want them in my business necessarily, but the city of San Antonio finally threw up their hands. They were some of the first people to do this and said, look, if we've got a low water crossing flooded um, and you have to get rescued, are we coming after you? You bet we are. We're coming after you. We do that. That's what first responders do. They're going to put their life at risk. Even if you made a bad decision, they're going to try to do what they can to save you. But when they get you onto dry shore, they're going to write you a ticket with about a thousand dollar fine. And that's where the city of San Antonio, I think, was pretty bright. We've seen that spread the state of Texas because nothing else was seeming to work. It wasn't keeping people out of low water crossing. Guess what? You go for a thousand bucks out of somebody's pocket, it makes them think. And it may, it was really the only thing that really um, may be helping the city of San Antonio, they, they, helping to hold down this because people were more afraid of getting that thousand dollar fine than they were of doing what? Losing their life. Um, all these neat things on computers. It's really colorful, it looks cool, all kinds of stuff. Folks just understand models are not gospel. Um, remember that we have satellites as well, some of the best satellite technology in the world. We have Doppler radars, which provide a lot of good data. We have everything from surface observations at airports, all kinds of stuff to, that are all what? These are all meteorological pieces of the puzzle. So we've got a lot of stuff out there. The only thing that with this meteorological cancer that I talk about, the only thing that I would remind you, what's one of the best tools that we have to forecast the weather? What is one of the best tools we have? And by the way, it does not cost a cent. And I'm telling you, it's overlooked nowadays and unappreciated. And one of the number one rules in weather forecasting is look out the window. And this is something that it's sad because I've seen so many TV stations, weather service, they have windows in their facilities, but they're high up. You know, give me a view of the sky. I want to see what I'm forecasting. Does it ever hurt for you to go outside and look at the sky? No, it's one of the most important tools that we have that doesn't cost anyone a cent. And in 2020, we get so enamored, if you will, with all these pretty pictures that we see on the tablets and so forth that sometimes I think we forget 
the basics sometimes. And one of the basics is, is go check it out. Go out there and look and see with your eyes, if you're able to do so, see what you're forecasting, see what the sky is telling you. Our clouds are like mother nature. In my opinion, I've always said mother nature's signature is written in the clouds. The clouds will tell you a whole lot when you, when you go out there and look at the sky sometimes. So um, also tell you one other thing, and this ties directly to weather safety. And Hear me out here because we have so many great men and women around this country that work for the National Weather Service. And by the way, the Weather Service is a heck of a bargain um, for having a few thousand people. And that's all the Weather Service has nationwide within the system. They are issue warnings, they issue general forecast for the general public 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every holiday. They're there all the time at our office down in New Braunfels. That being said, one thing that I believe is a little bit of a problem right now is I think that the Weather Service overwarns a little bit. Uh, their warnings, I think, um, it, I think that we get too many warnings. I think we ought to be a little more selective in the warnings we issue and, and practice a little more of the meteorology. I think sometimes, and I've actually been told this by some people, that the Weather Service sometimes would almost prefer to have a warning out just to say they had a warning out, and if they're wrong, to ask for forgiveness from the public for having it out. Um, you know what? I'd rather have that more science-based, because why? It goes back to chicken little syndrome. It, it, the sky's falling. At some point, people are, gonna, are not paying as much attention to the message. And as a result, I think we have to look carefully, make sure we're not overwarning. And, and by the way, Matt and everyone else, especially now because what our public we're already on edge this this country is on edge right now and we don't need that much more to send us over the edge and these weather warnings this has been a huge issue elsewhere in the country the last couple of weeks in the southeast where they have public tornado shelters guess what happened about a month ago they quit unlocking them because of what covid 19 restrictions and we've had to, as, as a, as a uh, profession, meteorologists, broadcast meteorologists, weather service people have had to go back to local uh, cities and counties and say, hold it. You can't not open that shelter. You have to open, if, you've got to have that shelter open because as far as I'm concerned, to some degree, if people practice um, social distancing, that tornado is the biggest threat. It, the tornado may be a bigger threat than COVID-19 is. And this is not something so much we see in Texas. We don't see public shelters that much. But I'm just telling you that this is something that, that we do. And we need to be kind of careful. Let's be a little more selective in our warnings, I think, and, uh, and, and try from, I guess, panicking the public. What? Maybe even more than, than they are, given the, the day and age that we're, that we're in right now. Um, this is something, and this is for the students out there to kind of think about, by the way, a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, you students out there watching, this is your baby. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but some of these problems that we, that I'm talking about tonight are issues that you have to confront. We have to figure out how to message better. Guess what? That's something you have to begin to look at. If that's something you're interested in doing in your career. Um, you know, these are all issues that you sort of have got to do all to deal with. This is yours now where I'm handing this to you and saying, help us come up with solutions of how we message better. But in talking to TV meteorologists and how they're able to get the word out, um, back when I was in TV, folks, you go in at two o'clock in the afternoon, you get a forecast together, you maybe put together, um, you know, uh, 10 or five or 10 or 15 slides for a weather cast at five, six, and 10. And if the weather was good, that's all you had to do. In 2020, I haven't done TV weather in eight years now, but in 2020, that's completely different for TV meteorologists. They're having to do what? They're probably, you see this in San Antonio and Austin, both. They're having to do not weather cast at five, six, and 10, but they're having to do weather cast at five, six, and 10 for two or three different stations that are part of their chain. They're, they're more, they're busier. They're having to do what? Social media. I'm I, every day. I, I I sit there and get on my knees and say thank you. I didn't have to do social media when I was back in television because what we're finding is is that 
TV broadcasters and broadcast meteorologists are telling us that they are not having the time to do the forecast properly because of these other duties. And what's their job? It's to do a, a broadcast explaining what's going on in weather. And if they're not able to forecast the weather because they don't have time because they're doing social media or putting together three weather casts for five o'clock for three different stations, I think it gets a little more difficult. And it's the same way the weather service. Um, you look at weather service offices 10 years ago, they put together text products. That's all they did. We have now what? We have the, in, uh, what, you know, the internet and we have websites where weather service people are now creating graphics all the time. And, and doing special graphics. And my question is, just like the TV people, does that take away from the weather services time and actually doing a good forecast? So these are all these are all issues. That's more meteorological that has to do with weather safety. But I think at the same time, these are all issues that we look at. And uh, I leave you tonight uh, as we get ready to go to some questions and we and go back to Matt here in just a second to at least do me a favor and do yourself a favor. And I'm, I'm going back to where I started, Matt. That shouldn't surprise anybody. Folks have a plan. And I'm not just talking about weather safety. I'm talking about right now, if, you're in, if you live in an apartment with roommates or you live with your family in a house, wherever you happen to be, have a plan for fire. Know what you're gonna do. Uh, have that plan long before you ever have to use that plan. Uh, same thing with weather. Uh, you know, if there's a tornado in the middle of the night, and by the way, when were the storms uh, out in Gillespie and Blanco County? They were four to five o'clock in the morning. So don't tell me we don't get tornadoes in the middle of the night around the hill country in South Central Texas. We do. You need to have those plans done ahead of time. Um, the people that you're around, your, your wife, your husband, your significant other, the people that are part of your life are important. And they are important enough to have that plan in advance. And that's, as I kind of wrap up my talk tonight in weather safety, uh, just remember, hope is not a plan. Uh, trust me, I've been uh, in the past, when I was in College Station a number of years ago, I lived through an apartment fire where I was um, basically brought out of the fire. I, someone, uh, someone saved me out of that fire as this apartment comp building burned down around me. And I've learned a whole new thing with that. I've learned you know, how to have a plan in case of fire or some of these things, because it's happened to me and I know it can happen to you. Have a plan, um, critically think about that plan and think about the people that are around you that you love and care about and, uh, and how that can make a big difference. Uh, and, and you don't look back with regret when something like this ends up happening. It's uh, about 43 after the hour, Matt. So um, let's, uh, let's play uh, Stump Troy. <laughs> uh, let's see if we, see if we sure. can Is the mic yeah. any better, Matt? Yeah, thank you so much for that yeah. presentation. So well informed. Uh, appreciate everything, everything that you, you spoke and, and your enthusiasm about the topic is uh, is just incredible too. So appreciate, you, appreciate, appreciate your service through the years to let us know what's going on with the weather. Your service is very much appreciated. And we have some people online here tonight with us from the Hill Country uh, who I'm sure share my sentiments uh, well as, as well. Uh, I've got a couple of questions that have been sure. submitted. And so I'll, I'll read those to you. Um, here one says, um, what should we look for on the weather radar? It says, what, what are the telltale signs for a bad storm? It says many people are watching a meteorologist, are not watching a meteorologist live anymore. Rather, they're just looking at a radar for themselves. So what should we look at to be informed? Well, you know, Matt, that, that's a whole class in radar meteorology, but I think the question is a great one because yeah. uh, we do have what uh, some of you some of you'll know exactly you know the weatherscope app I, I i'm not i can't recommend one but weatherscope is based uh, it's actually out of the uh, commercial uh, some of the commercial businesses that are up at ou um, weatherscope is a great radar app and a lot of people use it a um, couple of things about radar when you look at it remember radar itself is um, is a way to detect precipitation. For the people out there that may not know it, it's the way we see where it's raining, where there are hydrometeors in the atmosphere. And by the way, hydrometeors include snow, sleet, hail, um, 
there are other things that we can see on the radar as well. A lot of folks, especially in the Hill Country, have seen uh, over over time, if you haven't, then you haven't been watching close enough, where we can actually see bats leaving the caves around the Hill Country. We can actually see that on weather radar. Wow. Uh, when, uh, so that's one of the things that we see. But there are some things that I teach my classes at the university of things just to watch for. You don't have to be a meteor. By the way, I teach in a non-major program. So I'm not teaching meteorologists. I'm just teaching people that want a little science background with weather. And so this is the sort of the bread and butter. Sure. If you're watching radar, for the most part, you're watching something we call reflectivity. Reflectivity is nothing more than the radar sending out a pulse from New Braunfels, Texas, using our local radar and going out and traveling in a straight line. This beam spreads as it goes out. But what it's looking for is essentially water. It's looking for something, it's, it's tuned for precipitation. And when it hits that, a certain amount of the energy from that beam then bounces back to the radar and it does it instantly. And folks, that determines the color that you see. The bigger the raindrop, you go from light rain, which is green, to yellows and to reds. Those are usually the bigger raindrops. You know what the most reflective hydrometeor is out there? It is hail. And this is how weather service can use and broadcasters can tell us where the hail cores are in thunderstorms. So you get into very high reflectivity and a lot of purple colors. That usually will suggest uh, hail to some degree. Now, there are some other things we look at in radar. We can look at velocity data. We're seeing the raindrops out there of reflectivity. Velocity tells us how quick those raindrops are moving toward or away from the radar. That's based upon sound waves um, along the beam. But so reflectivity is what we see. So what do you watch for in reflectivity? That gets back to, your, to, the, to the answer to your question, Matt. Um, I will tell you now, watch storms that are moving very quickly. Uh, the quicker a storm moves, forward movement on it, usually the stronger the straight line winds are going to be with it. Now, most thunderstorms have a forward movement, maybe 20, 25, 30 miles an hour. That'll buy you some wind gusts up to 40 or 45. We experience that all the time around the hill country in south central Texas. Folks, you start kicking these storms up to 30, 40, 45 miles an hour, then you begin to see where we can go from a quarter to a half greater in those wind speeds, and we get into the severe categories. So watch storms that are moving very quickly, those are ones that we watch. Also watch for in reflectivity where the storms are on the radar and watch for storms, Matt, that aren't behaving like the rest of them. In other words, you've got maybe a line of storms. And by the way, that's sexy. You get that on the weather radar and you see the line of storm. People look at that, they see it. But if you see that line of storms out here and there's one storm out ahead of it, and it's racing off Northeast while the line's moving East, I'm gonna pay attention to that one storm because it's not behaving, it's not in a line like the rest of them. So you watch storms like that. Yeah. In reflectivity, one of the other things that you watch, and boy, this was amazing. Um, what is it, two Sundays ago, East, actually Easter Sunday morning, in the storms uh, out in northeastern Gillespie County in northern Blanco County, um, a hook shape in the reflectivity where it, it sort of hooks out. Folks, there's only one thing that'll give you a strange shape in reflectivity, and that's how the wind shapes the hydrometeors. And if you get a hooking effect, it's telling you you've got a pretty strong counterclockwise wind flow around that thunderstorm. So look for hooks, look for um, uh, weaknesses, look for notches uh, in storms where they kind of notch out. You want to watch those because those notches are many times uh, updrafts where the rest of the storm is kind of wrapping around it and you get that rotation. So watch for those sort of things. Um, trying to think uh, uh, with anything else. Uh, uh, there are, and by the way, there's some great sources online that'll help you. Just giving you a quick kind of a uh, kind of a here's what radar shows you. Some of the fundamentals. You don't have to be a meteorologist totally to understand that. Um, and I think that's a great question, especially nowadays when we got 750 apps out there that show us weather where you have to make a choice, but uh, right. it's a great right. question. Yeah. Good, good. Thanks, Troy. Thanks for that. That was a thorough answer. Um, moving on to another another topic here. Uh, 
a viewer from the Hill Country says that with many homes in the Hill Country being manufactured, yeah. what is the best way to protect from a tornado? That may not be a good answer to that question, but that's the question that's posed for you. You know, you know, Matt, I think there is a good answer to that okay. question. It goes back to where I started tonight. You, The first thing you've got to do is have a plan. Um, and you must act pretty early. Um, you can't wait to the last minute. And you know, that kind of is counterintuitive, Matt, to us as human beings. Yeah. You know, I, I can sit here and watch things all day long out here, but I'm usually going to wait till it gets right up on me. That's just the way we are. <laughs> you know, you're going to wait. wait and, due date, right? And, yeah. And, and, you know, um, what I'm telling you is a man is manufactured housing is amazing. Um, they have come so far with manufactured housing. It's a great place to live. And frankly, um, especially nowadays, it is probably most economical way for some people to live. It's a great place to be, right? except when a tornado is coming. Yeah. And that's the rule. And so a couple of things for you, uh, please, folks, have a weather radio. We have weather radios that we have transmitters for throughout the Hill Country, the National Weather Service. Austin, San Antonio, go out and get a weather radio and get someone to help you get it set up for your location. And by, if you can't find someone out there to help you do it, let me know. I'll help you do it. Um, we'll, we'll get it set up so you have it in your manufactured housing. But one other thing too, Matt, that we, and this, boy, this comes right out of Weather Brains last night in our podcast. We had uh, several social scientists and had several structural engineers. Uh, Matt, we've had in the last two weeks, we've had a number of people killed in the southeast in trailers, in, in manufactured housing. And one of the big things that some of the structural engineers brought up last night is if you're going to have these types of housing, that's great. But look how it is mounted or how it is, how it is put into its resting place. Most manufactured housing is just held into place by straps, which are not even cemented into the ground. If you're going to have that kind of, uh, if you're going to have manufactured housing, I have no problem with that. But when you're installing it, go the extra mile. You may have to spend a few extra bucks, but as part of your plan, have it so that there is a concrete block that is embedded in the ground with those straps so that when the winds really start blowing, you have a better chance. Most people don't die in mobile homes as mobile homes are shredded apart by tornadoes. They die when, Matt? They die when the mobile home goes airborne. Yeah. And you don't have a choice. And meanwhile, down the block a little bit, there's a house on foundation that sits there. And, and what's the problem here? It's not necessarily a manufactured housing. It's how the manufactured housing is is mounted into the ground, how it's secured. These things must be secured, and particularly in the more tornado-prone areas. Um, the Texas Hill Country is the most beautiful place in the world, and and I appreciate people that in any type of housing in the Hill Country, I envy them. Uh, if you're in manufactured housing, look at what's holding your manufactured housing to the ground. Find ways to maybe, you have to spend a few bucks, but find ways to secure it more. And you might also, if you live in manufactured housing, this is rough around here, um, but you might see if there's a way to have any other type of shelter somewhere on your property. I'm not saying you need to dig a hole because if you dig a hole around here in the old country, it involves a box of dynamite to do it. <laughs> um, but, but at the same time, you know, maybe come up with something external, maybe another shelter, cinder blocks that are tied together with concrete or something like that, maybe another type of shelter. But but I'm telling you, Matt, we go back. That question is a great one. And I think there is an answer to it. And part of it is to have a plan. Good, good. Thank you, Troy. That's a good answer. I'm, I'm glad you did have an answer for that. So we'll take your advice there. Um, <clears throat> another question. Let's move on here. Um, so tell us about what was the most challenging large gathering that you attended or helped coordinate and how do you need to adjust? How did you have to adjust the weather plan? Well, I think it probably, Matt, that's a that's another great question. It probably was that Iowa State football game at UT a number of years ago. I, I've had, uh, uh, I've probably uh, taken enough ulcer pills since then to kind of take care of what that created. <laughs> um, but at the same time, when you have, um, 
this game, Matt, if you can visualize and our listeners can visualize, we're coming out of halftime, not a severe storm situation, not at all, but a thunderstorm approaching the stadium. We're coming out of halftime and all of a sudden we have to enact a shelter in place where we're getting people down to the concourses. Um, again, I'm not just kidding you. There are people that hate Troy at this point. They, <laughs> they, they, they are out. They want to know where I am. And luckily I'm in the police department, so I'm protected, but <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, there are people mad. And, um, you know, it, you have to kind of go with the flow because, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be responsible if I've got a stadium full of people for the first lightning bolt to hit somebody in that stadium. Uh, you know, when you we use lightning detection and people say, well, you see that lightning ahead of time. Not necessarily. If it's the first strike, I never know where that one's going to hit. And I don't want it hitting inside that stadium. So when that storm approached, we made the decision to do that. We went into about an hour and a half delay. There are people that hated me, but we were back to football in about an hour and 40 minutes or so. Um, those are tough decisions to make, but you make those decisions, Matt, out of our care for our customers and the safety of our customers. That's what even we do in Kerrville on campus. You know, we, we're always worried about the safety of our faculty, uh, staff, and our students. And that goes uh, for any type of event. And we're just dealing with our customers in this case. And, you know, we do what we think is best. If we have to apologize somewhat after it's all over with, then I'm all for that. We can do that. But yeah. I would never make that kind of decision without, uh, with, I, I'm always looking out for the safety of those people in that stadium or the faculty, staff, and students at the University of Texas. Even, even when I would suppose, Troy, and, and this may be what makes it tough, it, as far as like Major League Sports and NFL and, and events such as that, where the bottom line and the, and the money um, associated with the event is a big deal. Huge deal. Is, is there some pressure that has ever been put on you or have you always been able to separate that that from your ultimate responsibility? Bottom line, University of Texas, Matt, it's a great question. I've never felt that pressure. Yeah, I, I have always the people, David Allison and safety and athletics and Jimmy Johnson and our, and our safety area at UT and our chief, um, David Carter at the University of Texas Police Department. They have always been willing to listen to me, and I've always appreciated that. We've made the decision we think is best, and so far, uh, fingers crossed, we, we've made the right decision. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. That's a huge responsibility, Troy, so thank well, you. And, and, I, and I also think, Matt, that's the reason that it's been a little slower happening in professional. Now, f professional football is all behind it now. You know that because, right. you know, as I pointed out, people get hacked off when the fo football games go into lightning delays. Baseball was a little bit slower at professional level, but we're seeing that also uh, beginning to kind of fall in the line. By the way, Matt, not the only thing. Um, you know, another big one is Little League <laughs> and baseball. Yeah. This has been one of the last groups, but Matt, I will tell you that August two years ago here in Austin, thunderstorm over campus. We're watching it. It's end of summer. Thunderstorm moves southwest into Oak Hill. The storm is five to six miles away in a soccer field at Oak Hill two small children struck directly by bolts of lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, no rain falling where they are. The storm's five miles away. Fortunately, both children uh, survived that, but they've been affected by that lightning. It's still affecting them these days. And when I look at that, nothing we can really do about that. That's where we have to get the public on board. But um, we're seeing more and more involvement even now with Little League uh, kiddo yeah. teams and parents. Huh. Okay, one, one more question here to maybe follow up, see if you can comment on this. Uh, what is the best weather plan for events that have multiple tents? When you have multiple tents set up uh, or similar to a field hospital, what, what's the best course of action during a weather event? Well, the best thing you can do, Matt, is have a plan there. Um, I will tell you that uh, Kevin Claisel up at OU sent me a picture and where we are today, is that if you have a plan, and they did have this with the mobile uh, of testing units, which are in place in Oklahoma City, uh, in most places they had them, but Matt, there was one location in Oklahoma City who apparently did not have a plan and did not get weather data. They had one of the tents that collapsed at a hospital where they were not, where they didn't have a plan, 
And that's, you know, if, if nothing else, we were lucky no one was injured there. Um, if nothing else in that tent situation, if we have a plan, at least, Matt, we can get people out of those tents. I don't really care much about the tents as long as I get the people out of them. All right. And, and, and part of that is is planning ahead. And I think this latest case with the COVID-19 and the, and the testing units that we're seeing being mobilized uh, in outdoor areas um, is just simply have a plan. What you're going to do, have someone that's watching the weather. I don't mean, they ain't got to be a meteorologist, be somebody in the hospital that's listening to weather and that can come out and say, okay, guys, we're through with the tent. We're closing down this. You saw that in Houston, by the way, Matt, last couple yeah. of days. Is the city of Houston several times over the weekend announced that's the end of testing for today because of severe thunderstorms affecting southeast Texas. You saw them close their testing sites. That's what you call mm -hmm. a plan. Yeah. Well, good. Well, Troy, to sum up, what I've heard from you is have a plan. Know what you're going to do in case of emergency. Look out the window and pay attention to your surroundings. Listen to your weatherman. Uh, and then be ready to act and respond. And don't and and one thing too, Matt, that I leave you with tonight is just don't ever say it'll never happen to me. Don't do that yeah. because life is too full of surprises. By the way, let me step back as we close, Matt. Let's go back to December, and I'm gonna and Matt and I are sitting here talking, and I say, hey, Matt, um, guess what? Next spring we're gonna be completely closed down. Everyone is gonna be at home. What, what would we have done, Matt? We would have sat there and laughed. We said, there's no way that would happen in this country right. or in this world. And just say never, and you will see. And you will see. This is certainly, certainly proof that we need to try to have a plan and foresee the unforeseeable, uh, as difficult as that is. But thank you for making the science of that, Troy. And thank you for, again, for all your service uh, to our communities around this hill country during your tenure and thank you for coming and visiting with us tonight and giving us this knowledge that uh that we need to have so well, we I, I, yeah uh, matt thank you y'all for the invitation to tanya and to to everyone jacob and everybody else and everyone there it's been been really my pleasure to be with you and all the people that are joining us online tonight uh, yeah. really been great and i've enjoyed it and be glad to do it again in the future very good thank you so much troy and thank you all for tuning in tonight uh, we wish you the best during this trying time. And uh, again, have a plan for preparation. Look out your window and, and be prepared to act when the time calls for it. Best wishes to all. Go Mountaineers.